Steve Gardner, Senior Minister here at St Paul's Anglican Church in Canterbury. Uh, we're really glad that you can join us, whether you're a regular of our church family uh, and you would ordinarily meet with us in person, or this is your first time uh, tuning in and listening in with us. For those uh, for whom St Paul's is our home and we gather face to face each week, there's a real grief today uh, because we can't meet together and that really sucks and we wish that weren't the case. We're going to make the most of the situation that we have. So we're going to do as many things as we can that we ordinarily would do when we gather. We're going to sing praises to our great God. We're going to bring our concerns for the world to him in prayer. And we're going to hear him speak in the scriptures a little later on. And I would really encourage you, particularly for those for whom St Paul's is your spiritual home, uh, that you keep the fellowship up after this service time. Get on WhatsApp, uh, message one another, and hang out with each other in whatever way you can safely do. For those who are totally new to this, um, a lot of this will be weird to you. And that's okay. It's weird for us too. We would encourage you just to make yourself known. Whatever platform you're uh, watching this service on, drop us a line. Let us know how we can best be serving you. But I want to begin by reading these words. I've been really encouraged by this psalm uh, this week, remembering that as I sleep each night and wake up to a changing world, there is one who doesn't sleep. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. I'm going to pray and then invite Mike and Anusha to come and lead us in our first song. Father, we thank you that you are watching over us even as we gather now from our lounge rooms, our homes, and we pray today you would feed us like you always do when we gather. Uh, speak to us deeply. For the good of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Teach your 
We pray for strength to care for the vulnerable, for eyes to see those who are less supported, for safety and health for medical staff, for selflessness in our supermarkets, for peace and grace in our modified working arrangement homes, for wisdom for our leaders in government, for gratitude for even the small things, and for patience and joy in trusting your will. Lord, we thank you that there will be a day where you will wipe every tear from our eyes, a place where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for you will make all things new. So we give our days and weeks to you, trusting in your good and perfect plan. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Friends, we're going to do something we do every week at St Paul's, and particularly at 5pm, we're going to open up the scriptures now, and as you're following along at home, I want to encourage you to turn now in your Bibles to John 17, uh, one of my favourite passages actually, John 17, I'm going to read these words from verse 20, these are the words of our Lord Jesus, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you've sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, if you've been uh, with us at St Paul's for a little while, uh, you will know that we had always planned to start a teaching series which began last week on the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is an ancient statement or declaration about who it is that Christians believe the God of the Bible is, uh, namely that He is Father, Son and Spirit. Uh, in God's kindness, this week, uh, the second week in this series, we were always due to look at what is one of the most comforting truths in all of the Bible, in all of Christianity, in fact. The first line of the creed begins with these words, we believe in God, the Father Almighty. And I know from talking with many of you over the week, over the phone and in person where we could, uh, there's a deficit of comfort. You're in need of real comfort. Just think of your last seven days and the frenetic change of pace that has occurred for you. Somebody in our congregation described it to me like living in a constant state of whiplash, never knowing what's going to change. I wonder how you're holding up with that. I know from talking with many of you and even some of you in the community who are perhaps tuning in for the first time right now, that there's real worry, a genuine worry about your health, about the health of vulnerable people you know and love, about your job, about our economy. I get that they are very real worries. I want to encourage you. Uh, whether you're a member of our church and you are with us every week or you're tuning in for the first time, that in meditating on this phrase that the creed brings to us, that God is our Father, will bring you great comfort today if you let it. For some though, uh, this idea that God identifies as a Father is not always a comfortable one. It could be that for you it just sounds all a little too strange and uncomfortable, a little too patriarchal. Or it could be, and I know again this is the case for some of you, it's a little too painful. Uh, for when you hear God reveal to you as your father, it brings painful memories and experiences of an earthly father, perhaps, who let you down, who quit on you. In our small group this week, a dear friend of ours was sharing as we were discussing these things and talking and praying for one another. She shared how it was on her 14th birthday that her abusive father finally pulled up stumps and quit on her and the family. But how in God's kindness she found herself as a 14 year old turning to him for the first time and literally saying to him, well, now I need you to be my father because I don't have one anymore. As painful and hard as it can be, 
to meditate on this reality that God reveals himself to you as your father, there can be comfort here too. But how? How does that play out? And at the end of the day, and particularly after a week like we've all had, what difference does it make? Because it has to make a difference if those things are true. I'm convinced it will make a difference. And I want to show you by uh, meditating on that passage uh, from John 17 that Jesus prayed. It's a prayer that Jesus prayed. We're going to see two things, two just really simple things today. That it's in Jesus that we see what it means for God to be the Father. It's only in Jesus that we see what it means for God to be the Father. But secondly, in a, a more personally uh, profound level, it's in Jesus that we are invited not just to know God his Father, but to experience him as our Father just like he did. Let's have a look at the first of those points, that it's only in Jesus that we see what it means for God to be our Father. Notice how that passage began, and again, I want to encourage you in your homes to open up your Bibles, John 17, verse 20, and notice how this passage begins. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I want to pause it there for a moment. Uh, at, at just at a surface level here, there's comfort already. Notice what Jesus is doing in these verses. He's praying. And notice who he's praying for. He says there in verse 20, I'm not just praying for my disciples who are with me face to face. I'm praying for all who will believe in me through their message. I take it that means people like you and me. Reading this 2,000 years later. And I take it, if that's true, and many theologians have mused about this, if that's true, that Jesus took time out to pray for you the moment before he faced his greatest trial, the moment before all of his friends deserted him, before he was beaten, uh, flogged and killed, he took time out to pray for you. I take it that that's what he's still doing today. As he conquered the grave and as he sits in heaven forever interceding, between us and the Father, he's praying for you now when you need him most. But it's in this prayer that Jesus prays that we really see what it means for Jesus to show us the Father and to show us what it means that God really is the Father. And more than that, it's in Jesus' whole life and ministry and teaching and the wonders he did that show us this. This is a big theme in John's Gospel, that it's Jesus who shows us the Father right back to the very beginning of the Gospel. We read this in John 1.14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just a couple of pages over in John's Gospel, we hear at Jesus' baptism, as he enters into the water, a voice booms out from heaven, to everyone's surprise, this is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Uh, Jesus at times in John's Gospel even has the nerve to say things like this, like John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's this theme all throughout John's Gospel that it's look at, looking at Jesus, observing him, that we see what it means for God to be the Father. These days we're living in feel apocalyptic. And again, I've heard people this week literally voice that to me. This just feels like an apocalypse. And it is, in a sense. Uh, the word apocalypse, it's really important to remember, means an unveiling, a revealing of what really is true. Jesus was and is an apocalypse. I always think of the image of the stage curtains being pulled back and the play is now presented to the audience. This is what we see in Jesus. The curtain is pulled back. And we now see God as he really is. There's an apocalypse, an unveiling in Jesus that God turns out to be not just some tyrant in the sky, but the Father. And that it is Jesus that shows us this points to two very important and unique aspects of the Christian faith. The first is its historicity, its reliability as a faith. Uh, no other faith that seems to me or worldview or system of belief is anchored in history quite like Christianity for its central tenet relies not on some religious teaching or dogma. It relies on a very real person who entered into time and place and history. So one Australian author put it like this, it really is when we look at the Christian God, it really is as if God has laid his head on the chopping block of public scrutiny and invites you to take a swing. There's something beautifully unique about this. 
that Jesus shows as he reveals the Father to us. It's grounded in history. But secondly, and even much more beautifully, I think, there's something very uniquely relational here that Jesus shows us. And I wonder if you picked up on that as I read out that prayer Jesus prayed. It's so relational. Listen to verse 24, where Jesus says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Again, you get that sense of the apocalypse there, the unveiling, the revealing. Jesus wants to show you something. Even those of us who are tuning in today 2,000 years later, he wants to show you something, something he had before everything else came into existence. Uh, what this shows us is the unique, beautiful, relational aspect of the Christian faith. That if you could trace everything right back to the beginning, uh, before this virus, before chaos, before famines and wars, disorder, before even all things came into being, right back to the creation, there was something beautiful going on. It's very unique. Many worldviews, many faiths, many uh, beliefs in God, different belief systems, will trace things right back to the beginning and say, as far back as we go, there, there was a moment of beginning, a creation story. Christianity goes back even further than that. So the first line of the creed doesn't begin with, we believe in a creator, we believe in a father. The Bible says repeatedly that the God who created all things was and still is existing in a perfect relationship of love and peace and unity. So if you trace things right back to the beginning, before things were called into existence, God existed in a perfect relationship of love. It's hard to know what the next few days are going to have in store for us. Uh, but one thing, I'm pretty confident that will be true, is that we'll be watching an awful lot more TV as we're stuck in our homes. Uh, if, like me, you think of your favourite TV shows, there will be a, a similar theme in many of them. And that is they often portray relationships, human relationships, in such a beautiful way that it kind of draws you in. It has this effect on you of pulling you in. You want relationships like that. Think of the TV show Friends, which surprisingly has made a huge resurgence in recent years. It portrays friendships that you, you kind of want to be like that. You want friends like that who will always be there for you with all their quirks and faults, but they're always there for you. Think of the way TV shows will, and movies will portray romantic relationships. It draws you in. You, you want a relationship like that. Even our news stories have changed the way they convey truth. Long gone are the days of just monologue of an anchor woman or an anchor man standing and talking before a camera like I am now. Our news stories, more often than not, like think of the project, a highly conversational, relational, sitting on armchairs, couches, uh, jovially talking about the news in a way that draws you in. Jesus has a similar effect. Uh, when you look at him, like we see him here praying to his Father, it has the effect of drawing you in. You see a relationship of such perfection and love and trust and beauty that you want it. And I reckon if you're watching from home and all of this is new to you, you've never really been to church before, I reckon if you're honest with yourself right now, you'll know that you don't just want a relationship like that, you need it. That in your heart of hearts, you're quite aware right now, perhaps more than ever, that you need a father like this, who will never let you down and never quit. And it's in Jesus that we see this. Jesus shows us, firstly, what it is for God to be our Father. But secondly, what we see here, and stunningly, is that Jesus now invites you in to experience God as your Father. Not just know about Him intellectually, but to experience Him as your Father, and that will change your life. Have a look at the way He prays here, verse 26. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me, in order that the love you have for me, may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Hear that, won't you? Hear that really clearly. Jesus prayed to his Father, the Almighty One, that the love he had for his Son, the one he existed with in all eternity in this relationship of perfect love and unity and peace, that intense treasured love, Jesus prays that you'll experience it's not a stretch to say, Jesus prayed that the same love he experienced from the Father, he now wants you to experience, that you would know the love of God in the same way that he did. It's astounding. 
It's so hard to get your head around this that you are invited up, if you're a Christian, to experience the fellowship of God in just the same way Jesus did. That some of the early theologians scratched their heads about how do we make sense of this and how do we communicate this beautiful truth? They tried a whole bunch of different analogies, but the only one that really stuck, that was developed in the first few centuries, was that God exists here in some kind of dance. That it really is as if we are standing on the edge of a dance floor watching this beautiful dynamic movement of a father and a son and his Holy Spirit forever moving around in this dynamic, evolving movement of love. And it really is as if in Jesus, he walks across the dance floor to us and taps us on the shoulder and invites us in to come and dance with God, to be invited into this divine friendship and fellowship. Uh, but how? How on earth does that play out? And like I asked at the beginning, what difference does it make? Because it has to if this is true. This only makes sense if you remember the second aspect of what the creed says about God. That he's not just your father, he's not just the father of the eternal son, Jesus. He's also the almighty one. The almighty one who can affect change. The one who, after all, called all things into existence simply at the drop of his voice. The one, again, at just speaking, sent his son into the world the first time to redeem it from the mess it's in and the one who will send him again. It's that God is both our Father and the Almighty One that we need to hold together to see how all of this will play out and change your life if you want it to. And you have to get this balance right. If God is only the Almighty One and not your Father, if He's only the Almighty One, inevitably you'll end up with a vision of God and an experience of God that at best is kind of like a slave and master relationship, pure obedience. At worst you'll end up with a tyrant. If, on the other hand, you only experience God as your Father, but after all, He's not really Almighty, you have some comfort, perhaps, uh, a nice, cushy idea, but at the end of the day, there's no help there, no lasting comfort. You need to hold both of these things together. And that it's in Jesus we see this, that God is both our Father and the Almighty One. It's Jesus who shows us this. So if you're reading along at home, You'll see just in the coming pages and paragraphs in John's Gospel what happens next. Jesus is tragically taken from his friends. Are the friends who had up to this point loved him and followed him now desert him? Many of us are very worried about isolation and loneliness right now, rightly so. Jesus knew what that, what that was like. He was isolated from the ones he came to serve and love. He was beaten. He was mocked, he was killed. And in all of this, the Bible says, the Almighty One was at work to effect change, lasting change. This is what it would look like for him to invite you in. I said those events happened tragically, that's a partial truth. They also happened in total accordance with the Father's plan and with the Son's will. He, he, he wanted this to happen. He experienced, just for a moment, what it would look like for the Father who had only ever delighted in Him and poured out His love and glory to Him. For a moment, it was really as if He experienced that Father abandoning Him and quitting on Him. There's no other way to say it, really. It really is as if that happened. And that happens so that that will never have to happen for you or me. That the Father quit on your son for a moment to bring you in. So that now you can have a relationship with God your Father, a relationship that will never quit. That's not threatened by death or job loss, insecurity or illness. There's a beautiful moment shortly after Jesus prayed this prayer. And after he went to that trial and his death, and he conquered the grave and came back to life, he gathered his disciples together one last time in John 20. And there's a real tone of grief because he's, uh, he's saying his farewell. He knows he's about to leave them. We can relate to that. We're grieved that we can't be here face to face right now. Jesus prepared his disciples for that. And he said, do not hold on to me. I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. 
Uh, it's so subtle, you probably missed it. Uh, I missed it the first time I read this. In John's Gospel, this theme of Jesus calling on God, his Father, dominates the whole Gospel story over and over and over again. Jesus will call God my Father. And often it was these statements that brought him the most heat because the first century Jewish hearers he was talking to heard that full well. They knew what that meant. You were claiming to be one with God. How dare you? That's blasphemous. But over and over throughout John's Gospel, Jesus would say things like, I am the Father of one, John 10 verse 30. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, John 14, verse 9. I am the only way to the Father, John 14, verse 6. But now, only after his death and his resurrection, for the very first time and the only time in John's Gospel, he says, I'm going to my Father and your Father. This is what it took. This is what it cost to bring you in, for you to be able to call the Almighty One your Father. It's often said, for good or for bad, and whether it's true or not, that the President of the United States is the most powerful person on the planet. Like it or not, that probably is true. Just think for a moment of the number of security checks you or I would have to go through to get into the President's office, the, the famous Oval Office. There's a really well-known photo, I wonder if you've seen it, of President JFK sitting at the desk, the most powerful desk on the planet, a desk that probably had buttons on it just to nuke their biggest enemies whenever he wanted. And sitting under the desk is his three-year-old son, uh, playing at his father's feet. Who would dare to get past all of those security checks and do that? Uh, only the child of the powerful one. It really turns out to be the case that you are invited to have such access with God the Father Almighty. Uh, the President is powerful, maybe. God the Almighty One is powerful. And you're invited to have such intimate access. So John, who's writing this Gospel account, will later say, my favourite verse in the Bible, God the Father has lavished His love upon us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. God the Father has lavished his love upon us so that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Friends, now, if ever there was one, is the time to make the most of that access that you've been granted. If you're a Christian, if St Paul's is your home, this week, do whatever it takes to draw near to your Father, to run into his office, not the Oval Office, the throne room of heaven, and call on your Father's name, and you will find an abundance of comfort and help this week. If all of this is new and a little weird, uh, we get that. But I wonder if some of you tuning in for the first time have observed something in Jesus here that does have that effect on you of it's drawing you in. If that's you, I want to just speak to you for a moment and encourage you, go with that feeling, don't squash it up, don't ignore it, go with it for a moment. It could just be, even right now, in your lounge room, that God is calling you in and inviting you to call him your father. We would love to help you out if that's the case. Why don't you drop us a line in whatever platform you are watching this. We will make sure you get connected with our church email list. In the coming days, we hope to set up an online discussion group to talk through these things and what it might mean for you because it will change your life and bring comfort and help and hope if you let it. Friends, when we look at Jesus, God's Son, uh, we don't just see what it means for God to be the Father, we are invited to experience Him as our Father. A Father that you and I now need more than ever. A Father who will never let us down or quit on us. Let's pray. Great God and loving Heavenly Father, we pray for us, believers and doubters alike, that now you would help each of us to draw near to you, to come into your office, the throne room of heaven, and find an abundance of comfort and help and hope for this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, for our regulars here at St Paul's, uh, one thing we do each Sunday, we do notices. Because uh, we're a family, we do some family news of things that are going on in the life of our church. 
I just have a few really brief things that I wanted to mention to you. The first is, again, speaking to those who perhaps this is all new and you've tuned in for the first time, I would just reiterate there, I would really encourage you to reach out. Let us know how we can best help you. If you're looking for a longer term connection with us, it's not going to look the same as ordinarily it would. It'll probably be online and in person at a safe distance when we can do it, but please reach out to us and let us know. It could be that you're watching this and you're in need of some help right now. Over the last week, we've set up a care network at our church where we are hoping to share the love that Jesus has poured out to us with those who are isolated and vulnerable in the community. It could just be that you would benefit from a phone call every now and then. Please do reach out to us and let us know if we can be of help. For those who are regulars to St Paul's, now is the time that we are really going to need to lean on each other. If you're already hooked into one of our small group communities, again, it's just worth being realistic. It's not going to look down. We're not going to be able to meet in each other's homes every week like we used to. But wherever it's possible for you to maintain that physical connection with people, please keep it up. It is going to be so important for your mental health, your spiritual well-being, to still see your friends from church, to pray with them, to read the Bible together. It's going to look different but it's important that you keep striving for ways to do that. And I would encourage you that as we experience and experiment doing church online like this over the coming weeks, to try as hard as you can to make it as genuine and authentically church as you can. Uh, to gather in people's homes, to do that where it's safe to do so. To read the passages that we read out as we preach. To sing along, as awkward as that might be in your lounge room. And to keep discussing about these things once the service finishes, please keep doing that, like you normally would over dinner at 5pm here at St Paul's. But friend, I want to leave you with these words, that throughout the ages, Christians have finished their time of fellowship together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.